Hello and welcome to this episode of the Event Manager Podcast, the podcast for curious event professionals who want to stay ahead of the game. My name is Miguel Neves, and I'm the editor-in-chief of EventMB. In this episode titled Passionate Strategy, I have the pleasure of speaking with Senthil Kopinath, the CEO of ICA. We cover a lot of topics around the future of the event industry, including why passion is such an important part of building a business strategy, the importance of bringing outside knowledge into the event industry, why understanding the participant experience is the secret to making events stand out, why being attractive to a younger generation is important for the continuity of the industry, and we talk about why we cannot ever afford to stop collaborating inside and outside of the industry. I hope you enjoy listening to this conversation, and I invite you to check out the other episodes of the Event Manager Podcast. You'll find them on our website or on your favorite podcast service. And now for a word from our sponsors, PHL Life Sciences, a division of the Philadelphia Convention and Visitors Bureau. Host your convention or trade show in Philadelphia, one of America's leading life sciences hubs. PHL Life Sciences, the first and only CVB division of its kind, will connect you to the professionals at the forefront of your industry and to a culture you can only find in Philadelphia. A city known for its rich history that's forging a bright future, Philadelphia challenges the expected and defies convention. A world of discovery is waiting. Visit phllife.com to learn more. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Event Manager Podcast. I am delighted to have with me today Sentil Kopinath, the CEO of ICA. Welcome, Sentil. So nice for you to join us today. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you for having me. It's indeed a pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, wanted to um, get really you to introduce yourself. Tell us, you know, who you are, and and I, I mean, you have a really interesting background and kind of story. You've covered lots of different kind of areas of the industry. So I'd love you to kind of take us through that journey uh, until you know today really thank you miguel uh, thank you for this opportunity i mean it's always nice to talk about how your own career evolved over the, over the years i've always i was always passionate about tourism i always wanted to get into the leisure tourism sector but for some reason i always ended up starting from my career onwards getting into the the meeting segment and of course the broader my segment then known in the past uh, I started uh, as, as, as a DMO, as, as a bureau. Uh, I, I just uh, grew as, as to head the bureau in, in my own country, in Sri Lanka. So we restructured the bureau, the first public-private sector partner bureau in the entire Asia-Pacific region. So that was put off. Or the model was put in there by, by the support of UNWTO. And then, uh, yes, that's how we started my career, promoting the destination and looking at various marketing and uh, meetings in the uh, opportunity. Of course, it was a small country, small business, but it, there was a lot of learning, a lot of best practices to follow, looking at many other uh, mature destinations at that time. Uh, moving on from there, I got into uh, working for the, the CUNY Travel as, as more as a, as a DMC there uh, for their regional head. Uh, so I was more look, moving from a DMO position to a, 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 a DMC position where you do the ground handling. And you look at handling conferences, exhibitions, uh, yeah, anything related to them meeting my segment. Off from there, I just uh, came off to move from the region, came into the Middle East. Uh, I was part of the uh, Emirates Group as their business development head. Primarily, the region was growing, uh, Dubai as a destination. Uh, it was very new to Dubai to start uh, attracting and bidding for larger meetings coming into the uh, destination starting from early 2000. And that's where Emirates set up this unit of um, um, the PCO unit, uh, uh, Congress Organizer unit. I was heading that unit primarily looking at uh, bidding for larger congresses, to name a few like the World Diabetes Congresses, World uh, Hepatology Congress. So you, you name all these big ones. So pretty much I moved into the uh, the core part of meeting industry business from there. Um, and then, of course, uh, working with the airline as well. So I was working more from airline and the PCO. So that gave me a lot of knowledge to see how the aviation industry looks at our business and our industry from the business events industry. So I learned a lot from both segments. And then, of course, moved on from there to the regional role of uh, ICA because I'm so passionate of ICA. I've been ICA member almost for 18 years. So at that point, I decided I need to be part of this community. Uh, more than a member side, I need to come into the ICA side. And there was opportunity to join the regional uh, office as a regional director Middle East. 
again, relatively a small region, but it became a very successful region in about three-year period. We turned around, again, uh, bringing new bureaus opened up, new venues opening up. So building networking, building strong education component. So ICA brand became very strong. And then the opportunity came in uh, to look at uh, the ICA CEO position. And then I was lucky enough to get that position. And in the last three years, I'm, I'm in the position of uh, ICA CEO. But the most important why I gave you a short uh, story about where I went through. I always uh, felt it that it's very vital you to cover all segments of our meetings industry. So you are a DMO, DMC, you're a PCO, you're an airline. You've been a venue as well. I, I work for venue also in my own country. And then you become the association. So uh, the, the, all, the, the, all the pieces of the puzzle, I've had the opportunity of learning before I took on this role. So I truly understand uh, all member segments currently when they talk to me about their business, about their challenges, about their difficulties. That helps me a lot uh, in terms of uh, talking, having dialogues and collaborating with them. I think you make an excellent point there. The, the wide experience is hugely beneficial to, to kind of understanding all the industry. Um, I noticed in your bio, you, you the first thing you, you mentioned is you call yourself a passionate strategist. Um, could you explain to us what that term means to you? Yeah, uh, it's very important. We, we Either we, we all become strategists or in a particular business or we become passionate. Why I always look at the passion and strategy is very important. When you have passion, uh, when you want to build a strategy for a particular industry, whatever you want to do, whichever industry you are in, if you don't have the passion, the strategy does, tends to drive towards the business goals. So it's always you look at, okay, this is the, my company wants it, this is the business strategy, and I put that plan together. But we, we tend to miss our own passion towards it. So that because if you put your own passion there, uh, your team and you're achieving your goal becomes very much uh, relatively easier. And it becomes long-term as well because you want to stay in this business much longer rather than looking from a job point of view. That's what I, I always tell that when you have a, a passion towards a strategy, your strategy always tend to work more successfully. I like that. You, you know, it's really uh, passion and strategy combined can really, um, can really take, take things to the next level. And uh, a curious question, uh, which I hope you, 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 you find also curious. Uh, how do you explain to people outside of the industry um, what you do or, or more, I think, more what ICA does, you know, the organization that you lead? Believe me or not, uh, excellent question, uh, Miguel. It's a big challenge up until now. Even to tell my own family members, it's not easy. Uh, particularly your, your very valid question outside the industry. But I always tell a uh, very simple uh, uh, definition. We bring people together. So we are the people who bring people to meet each other. So it could be two people meeting, it could be 2,000 people meeting. So that's that's my the initial start of explaining what is our industry all about. Then I then I give the other, other definition, who are these people who ensure to meet the, bring these people together? Is the tourism board, I first start with the tourism board and then give a definition to the convention bureau. Because if you say the uh, convention bureaus directly, a lot of people outside the industry don't understand. Tourism boards, they understand. So majority in the world, bureaus are pretty much under the tourism board as, as an entity. And then I talk about a venue, I say, it's the, it's an exhibition center where you go for a normal consumer fair. And that's where we do our congresses. So in a nutshell, that's what I put the story together. I think it's it's really interesting. I think you you you, you take a, an approach similar to, to many other people who have asked this question, which is in some sense to simplify, you know, to make sure that the conversation is accessible, which I think is, is important. Do you think that that is a sort of symbol of any sort of barrier um, or is that just a natural thing? Like I think in other industries also are quite complex and hard to explain. Do you think it's just a normal thing or is that something that we should work towards overcoming in some sense? Absolutely, Miguel. In the last two years, I've been really, really emphasizing at every forum that we, we well, not only because of the, the COVID situation, even primarily before, when I started my career, I always looked at in this business, lack of awareness, because unlike any other industry, uh, we are not very technically oriented. We are with the people. We are on ground in any city. People do see of, uh, congresses are being organized. People see that we organize large events. But we as industry have failed hugely in the last two decades to create awareness of what we do and how important our industry to the rest of the world. 
So that's a, you're very right. I mean, it's, it's a huge barrier there. That's what we struggle to explain, uh, be it somebody at the grassroots level or be it somebody at, 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 at the policymaking level. We struggle explaining who we are. It's primarily because that we have never created this awareness. We have been busy organizing our own events. We were building, promoting destinations, but we always forgot the local population. We forgot other industries. I mean, if I give you an example, the health industry, today, the last two years of driving what we should do is driven by the health ministers and the health sector. We never spoke to them, so they never knew the importance of our business. We have been only talking to the aviation and tourism ministries, saying, okay, you, oh, you need to subsidize, you need to support our industry. But we forgot there is another big element. If there is a pandemic uh, around the corner, health, health, health sector makes the decision, the frontline uh, makes the decision whether to open the city, whether to conduct the business, is it safe or not. So again, that's a pandemic uh, situation. But even pre-pandemic, I, I even keep saying that even at university level, we need to educate uh, how important our industry is. I, I normally give a very grassroots example. Our industry is the only industry, uh, Miguel. You can meet an engineer in the morning, you can meet a doctor in the afternoon, and a lawyer, and a politician in the evening if you are a conference organizer. Or even if you're a DMO, because you're bidding for four different congresses. So you're making, doing your RFP or discussing with the association of, of who's a doctor, who's leading the association. So that kind of exposure, that kind of importance our industry has. So even somebody younger coming to our industry, if we can educate that this is the entry into our industry, it will hugely benefit. But we don't do that, unfortunately. Absolutely. I think there's definitely a, an opportunity there to, to, to kind of improve. So I wanted to take you uh, into kind of the world of events. And I know you have the experiences as a PCO and a, and a DMC and other roles. And of course, you know, it, it revol always revolves around events. But I think you'll agree with me when you think that great events can be milestones. They can be life changing. They can really change people's careers, people's perspectives. But, you know, I think we will all aim to design great events, to create great experiences I, in your mind. What does it take to get an event to be good, to go from good to great, you know, to really excel? What, what are there kind of basic things that an event needs to get absolutely right to go from good to great? One of the most important thing, uh, Miguel, is understanding your participants' experience. Now, this is, has nothing to do with the, what we are doing after uh, looking at last two years. Even way before, when we started three decades ago as an industry, we always started with the objective of creating experiences because people come from different parts of the world, different education levels, uh, different exposures. So every event had its own way of creating experience. Yes, we grew over the years. We created new designs, new models. But by becoming larger, larger meetings and growing, we, f we lost the focus there. What is that experience all about? And what is the purpose of that meeting? So once you create the experience, you will achieve the purpose. So it could be any industry, it could be medical, it could be anything you're talking of. So I think we lost, uh, anybody who wants to grow the uh, meeting from good to best or even to uh, the, the best, it's very important not to lose focus on the experience. When I say experience, it could be experience of the content, experience of the networking opportunity, experience of the journey of the participant. You know? If I'm a first-time delegate, from the time of I receive my badge, till the end, I say goodbye at the farewell, uh, lunch or dinner. That's where the experience, I think, I think we became very monotonous. We became very structural uh, in organizing these events. So anybody who keep following that format will definitely will struggle to grow the event or even struggle to achieve the quality because if the, if the delegate experience is lost, which is fundamental in our, whether it's a smaller corporate meeting, larger association meeting, that's fundamental. I think makes some excellent points there. Um, and is this sort of, how you imagine the future of events you know we're 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 now hopefully in a in a post pandemic period we're recording this in late april 2022 and events in person events are happening how do you see those events uh, being different or not from from events that happened before so you know your vision for a, an event that is great but with this kind of future setup or, or whatever technology or anything that you think is necessary to make that happen? I think, unfortunately, we are a little bit going back on what we were doing, even in the current recovery stage. So we have gone to pre-pandemic level, doing the events in the same format, uh, same structure. 
I'm, I'm glad to say that the the content has changed very much uh, in terms of uh, bringing very different thought provoking ideas, different thoughts outside the industry content has has grown relatively really well. That's a good sign. Uh, I mean, that's a very positive sign. But going forward, I would say that uh, leaving content aside, the structure of our events needs to change. So it's not about we all coming. Yes, we all create for in-person event, which is important. We need to meet, we need to network. But the the indebtedness of what we are trying to, uh, the message, what we are trying to give has to change at the event because there are so much of activities going on across the world. And now with the recovery stage, again, we are back to doing back-to-back -back events. So my my personal opinion is that it's very important take a, take a blank sheet of paper and draw there to see uh, what is this future content all about. You know, are we are we are we teaching what we have done like last two decades? Are we talking about that, or should we talk about next two, uh, two decades? Like you rightly said, using technology as a part, using new innovation as a part, AI is a part. So we need to bring which which if you see in the other industries, all those has been part, part, of, part of their events and their their structures. I think we as a meeting industry or a business events industry, we are missing that part. Uh, it could be a financial reason. It could be that we still don't have that exposure into those industries. So we are struggling to get there. Uh, I must say that uh, during pandemic, we got there to some extent. We started looking at all these experts outside who are the technology gurus, who are, who are really can talk about uh, sustainable development uh, of the industry, uh, who can talk about various other climate change issues. So, so we, we think we have reached out. But my biggest concern is that are we again going to put that back and go back to what we did? You know? So we need to be very cautious that we move from there, we set our bar to the next level. You know? So we continue to go. Uh, it's not a topic we use due to we all were virtually connecting. It's used for to change the experience and create a purpose in our events. So that's what I, I've been emphasizing to my events team in ITA. Any, any, any structure, any model of smaller to bigger event when you put, keep that in mind. Let's really upgrade our, our, our position. Absolutely. And I think you've already mentioned a few of the challenges that we're facing, but I'd love you to talk a little bit about what you see as, as the kind of major challenges in the industry um, going forward. One of the biggest challenges, uh, Miguel, in our industries, knowing outside knowledge, you know, because we are pretty much very comfortable in who we are, what we organize, and we tend to repeat that. But what's happening outside our industry, to bring that knowledge into our industry, unfortunately, we are quite weak. Huh? I'm saying we, we, are, we as ECAR needs to take the lead there as well. We also can constantly look at who this knowledge and who are these people we need to embrace and bring it to our industry. So it could be from any sector, uh, it could be on innovation, it could be on technology, it could be on climate change, it could be on sustainability. So there is a huge pool of people who don't know, like we started, I said, who's our industry. So we will achieve two objectives. By bringing them, we will introduce who we are. We talk about our industry, we tell them this is what we guys do. On the second part of the opportunity is that our industry, our in, uh, the colleagues in the industry will learn what's happening in those industries and what those segments are. So our, our Congress in, uh, or the meetings at the end becomes more uh, credible, more opportunity, offer more opportunity to our delegates. So I'm going back to, again, the experience and the purpose. So they will achieve. So if, I, if I'm a day, participant, if I attend, I'm not expecting to see how do I do RFP? How do I do the contracting of my venue? Because that is available in our industry learn. But what are the innovations? What are the technological advancements I can use to make my business better? To achieve those topics, you need to bring those outside speakers. I think that's our one of our biggest challenge. Uh, again, how do we achieve this? Uh, you need to make a lot of investment. I understand because these these knowledge doesn't become uh, quite. Uh, I, I don't want to use, use the word cheap, but it's not it's it's not easy to access because we are we are very good in accessing the knowledge within our industry or in the periphery of our industry. But when you go a little further, uh, l l let's say for example, if you bring to bring something like Elon Musk, you know, I know it's like at the top of the end, but Something like that knowledge, I mean, that's need to find a way. So it needs investment. But more than the investment, I think I would look at it. We as association, we don't have that kind of uh, huge um, uh, uh, the financial benefits. But still, we have the network. That's the beauty of our industry. Through our network, we can reach. So if all of us collaboratively, each uh, meeting industry association, start focusing on these elements, 
we will start building this knowledge step by step by step. It's a long process. It's not going to happen in, uh, in, in a year or two. But in the next uh, decade, we would have transformed our industry and bought into those knowledge spheres. Otherwise, we'll go back in what we are doing in the next 10 years. It sounds to me like you're saying we would really benefit from external knowledge, you know, um, business knowledge, industry knowledge, other innovation, anything like that. And I think that makes a lot of sense for a kind of more senior part of the industry that has the experience, right? They know how to organize events. They know the details. How do you think you can balance that? Because I would imagine as, as ICA, you have to provide education for your members and you have members at all parts of the spectrum, right? So you still, I, I would imagine, still want to educate people on how RFPs work, how bids work, how Congresses work, etc. But you're really saying we need to do more. And how do you think you can balance that out? Because I feel like in some sense, what you're saying is you want to bring like an MBA level education into the industry. Um, isn't that something that people should go outside the industry for? Or why do you think we need to bring that into the industry, you know, how do you think we can do that? It, it, it's not. It's not about academic. You're, you're very right. We, we. I'm not saying that we will tend to take the fundamentals what we teach uh, at our events. Those would remain. It has to. You have to strike a balance, of course. But it's not about the uh, MBA level. What I'm looking at is those knowledge getting into the industry. So you, you don't need to do a certificate certificate program to learn, or you need to go go into that higher level. If we can bring those knowledge step by step into the industry while having the traditional knowledge as well. So we are not going to overnight, like I said, won't change entire our model to 100% external knowledge. Why I'm talking about external knowledge is because that will really transform the industry to look at how the ways of new ways of working. I mean, let's look at the Miguel, the COVID, uh, pandemic time. We all start searching for what's new, you know. We even started using various new words, new normal, new this regeneration, reinventing reformatting. Why? Because our knowledge sphere was very limited within the industry. If we had those knowledge, uh, I, I don't, yes, we knew uh, due to pandemic, we can't organize even, but we wouldn't have faced such a drastic learning process when the times are difficult. So at least we are somewhat prepared over the years so that if there is another challenge or another disaster comes our way, we know how to really, you know, flip the industry and survive. Now this I'm looking at from a smaller PCO company, DMC company, smaller bureaus. So I'm looking at everybody's benefit. You know? So some of them who, who survived during a pandemic, due to government support, they survived. But there are many companies struggle to even organize because for them, even a virtual event became something new. How do I do this? You know, Does, does something like exist? I never done this before. You know? So maybe we need to look at that transforming that knowledge Again, yes, like I said, we will continue to do what we, uh, the RFP models, what the association models are, how do you work with the bureau, how do you work with the venue. So those are fundamental teaching, ICA will continue. But it's time for all of us to take some kind of ownership to bring outside the ordinary into our industry so that uh, the younger, gen you, you'll be amazed how the younger generation looking at the industry. That's one of the reasons that we are unable to attract a younger generation into our industry. Today, you, you look at uh, uh, the, the uh, employing skillful people is a biggest challenge because they are looking at the industry still pretty much uh, traditional because they, they see outside there are a lot of things have changed but I can't learn or I can't benefit if I come to this industry. So if you strike a balance it will it'll solve a lot of our challenges. I'm not saying. Are you ready to celebrate your successes in the world of meetings and events? The Skift Meetings Awards are back for 2024, recognizing the most innovative business events companies across 15 categories, and we want you to be a part of it. Winners will feature on Skift Meetings, sending a clear signal to events professionals around the world that these are partners they can rely on. The final deadline for submissions is June 11th. We encourage you to start your submission today to secure the best entry rates. For more information and to start your submission, head to live.skift.com. I think that that's really fascinating. I, I was just thinking, so, you know, you mentioned Elon Musk or, you know, as an example of, you know, a keynote or someone really, you know, knowledgeable, mediatic that could bring something interesting to an event. Um, I remember earlier, you also talked about how 
we need to connect with different industries and, and kind of make those bridges, not only when we need them, when we're in a crisis, but at all points, right? Do you think that there is a way to connect with those industries in a way that we can bring that content into conferences, events, and into our general education, but also that we can educate. And I'm saying this because I think, you know, if you were able to get Elon Musk to come to the ICA Congress, I mean, I'm sure it'd be great. I'm sure it would attract a lot of people, but I, I, I would imagine that Elon Musk has a very busy schedule and, and the amount of education he'd want to kind of consider about the event industry would probably be minimal. So how do we, how do we break that barrier so that we actually use it as an opportunity to also bring knowledge of the education into the other industries? Question begin. Yeah, that was an example. I know it will be too difficult to get him down for one of our events. Uh, uh, we, we, good, uh, good question, and, and it's, it's it's the right opportune time you ask that question. Uh, I, I in ICA, what we did we did is uh, I don't know that you saw the ICA certification program. We changed all of our models, starting from last year. It's you creating your own experience. So even even this year's Congress, what they're doing. We are going to grassroots level to every member across the ECA membership in every sector, every uh, achieving the diversity as possible in every region, telling them, send in your proposal, look at your local community, what kind of uh, speaker you want, what kind of topic needs to be addressed, and start submitting that to ECA. So I know in, 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 in a medical congress or any other congresses, you submit abstracts, but abstract is more related to your own uh, uh, learnings or your own industry. But here, we have gone to the industry asking them, uh, looking at the de destination, DMOs, the venues, who are very influential in their local community, who can approach those sectors outside our industry because they bid for Congress, they are the local ambassadors, they work with the local mayors, local policymakers. So we have approached all of them starting from two weeks ago. Come in with what you feel is uh, valuable to that community and who those outside industry speakers. So it's a start, it's, it's, a, it's a model. Uh, it's more like a startup. We are trying to see, let's take that lead and look at how we can approach the industry, outside the industry, and bring that knowledge. So this year's Congress will pretty much have a good balance of our traditional Congress model, but again, looking at outside the industry, again, very selective. We look at what is more important, what is uh, prudent for our industry. Those uh, will be uh, sort of uh, showcased at the Congress. So yeah, that's one of the models we have looked at, we have gone into our members across the world. It does sound, we talk a lot about the kind of idea of personalizing experiences. And, and I think it's something that a lot of event tech companies are, are trying to do uh, for the future. You know, it seems to be the, that creating a unique personalized experience for each attendee seems to be a, a little bit, a little bit still in the future. Not quite, not quite, uh, yeah, most companies are not able to do that quite yet, but, but I think definitely something that people are aiming for. You're right. Even with us, it's, it's a starting point. You know, it's a personal experience. Uh, Ika Ika members who come to the Congress or Ika events, they always have that personal approach. Yes, but but that's more networking. But we are trying to build the entire experience more personalized. And it's it's a long road. Yeah, you're right. It, it's very much in the future. So now we're talking about Ika a little bit. So I wanted to kind of t you to take me through through kind of Ika's Ika's. Um journey, I guess, it, through the pandemic in the last couple of years, you've only been in the role for a year, I believe, when, when the pandemic started. So it, it's, it seems like, you know, you really, you know, interesting timing, of course. Can you take me through a little bit of that evolution? I know that it also recently started having uh, association members. So there's sort of like shifts happening that I'm sure uh, some coincided and some didn't with the pandemic. So maybe give us a little bit of an, of an overlook uh, or an overview of, of how that's shaping up. Because I, I just within five months I joined the pandemic came my way so it was, uh, but 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 for me uh, when I went for the last uh, almost three years now uh, in the role, but having said that what we looked at it as an organization, it has been always the global meetings industry association, uh, where very uh, it's a very strong uh, network of people that's what we we are a family we call it a family, working closely together. Uh, with huge uh, contribution by the industry over a period of many, many years, I'd say more than five decades. Uh, but it was vital for ICA to look at um, a living pandemic aside. I'm just going to keep that aside. It was very important for ICA to look at what changes ICA needed and what ICA has been servicing to its members overall as a global industry. How do we transform ourselves? So from 2019, 
I, I we started working with my team here yeah, with the ECA board, started looking at this implementation process. Uh, yes, so pandemic was something unpredictable, but we always started that process primarily looking at how do we really get close to members because we have grown as 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 a entity in over 100 countries, and and it's at very different levels of membership requirement, diversified uh, approaches, uh, different levels of uh, entry level to the industry. Some are very mature, so it was very vital Ica, to really look at, take a step back, look at all its service uh, the offerings look at the ways of approaching members, personalizing the experience. So that's where we started in 2019. But again, when 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 2020, when the pandemic came, we didn't really uh, stop anyone, any of those activities. Uh, yes, we all moved everything into a different format, virtual and IV format. Again, in the past, it has never done that as well. But one of the very important fundamental thought was we need to connect the community across the world. Because that we started in 19 putting the process together, how do we go from? So due to pandemic, we didn't want to slow down. So we used every mode, every tool, every technology technology possible, uh, looking at the ICA Congress, creating regional hubs, uh, looking at even our business exchange going online. So even members conducted business using digital formats. So you were even winning bids for 23, 24, 25 using a digital business exchange rather than in the past it was in person to in person. But then we change to digital. So the overall structure of ECA has been really transformed to achieve these goals. And of course, we also was looking at diversity, inclusion, sustainability as our key pillars. So we want to achieve this throughout the period. We don't want to really uh, look at that uh, as, as a challenge during the pandemic. So ECA Skill is another project, huge project launched during the pandemic. Again, we, 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 it was already planned in 2019 to launch this project uh, end of 2020. So due to pandemic, reskilling became very important, but we are already planned for it. Because we, like I said all during the call in the last 30 minutes, it's very important to bring that different types of knowledge to our industry. So we decided, okay, this certification program, again, the model is community engaged model. Authors of this uh, ECA skill program is our own members in the industry and some are outside the industry. So it was not created by a consultant, it's somebody like you, Miguel. Each one of you have given your experience in the past, what's happening today, and what's going to be the future. So you, whatever your knowledge you've been learning on the ground has been put into the context, into the curriculum, so that from a future, anybody who's learning there will understand what has happened in the past and where we are going in the future. So that was another project. All the hybrid events became very large events, the congresses. The, we also decentralized all of the approach. We started going into regional summits across the world. Again, going back to what we planned in 2019, personalized experience model. So every region had its own uh, regional summit, which was never the case in the past because we had only uh, global events. So we regionalized. And then we started doing the Congress. Um, on top of that, we started um, working on a lot of engagement with members at chapter levels, again, at uh, regional summits. We also launched huge association segment event because ICA, the global association community, uh, sorry, ICA association community has grown bigger and bigger uh, because ICA is the only association where you have the supplier community and you have the association community under one umbrella. So that was launched in 21 again, uh, sorry, 2020 January. And then we started progressing with that. And that community has grown really big. So these two segments have started uh, working together collaboratively. way. So in all our events, we see that Extensively, the association community is having dialogue so that the, uh, the the ECA membership can understand how are the RFPs going to be, what are the changes, uh, what's the association community's future forecast, what are they looking at, uh, have they changed their model of their event? So that's helping a lot. So, fundam so fundamentally, we did a lot of shifts uh, in the ECA structure itself so that uh, we are ready for the future. Uh, so basically, we, we, we considered ourselves more from uh, from completely looking at our model of what we did in the last five decades, we said, okay, no, now it's time to rechange, remodel, and do. Again, this is not due to pandemic. It was very much planned uh, early 2019, and then I came on board mid 2019, and then started implementing. So, just to expand on the on the kind of bringing in associations into ICA, um, just curious about you know how that was. Uh, 
projected how, how you thought that was going to work out and 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 kind of uh, attracting the associations i can definitely see from the you know the destinations having associations involved is greatly beneficial but the attraction for the associations has that worked like like you planned and how has that sort of developed in terms of bringing them into the fold good question i think initially it was a challenge to be honest uh, Miguel, because the associations were always taking part in eka events so for them yes i'm part of eka events so why i need to be out of community but when we created a separate entity within ECA as association segment division, so we created that in uh, 2020, to really engage and get huge amount of opportunity for associations, not only working on ECA events, but learning about the business events industry, learning about what's the future. And most importantly, the, within the associations, they needed a platform to talk peer to peer. Now, that was, a bit, that was always a challenge for associations because they were doing that in certain areas. I mean, there are a group of uh, association communities uh, today, I mean, if you take uh, in Europe and in, in the US, AC, but across the world, they, they want to understand the global knowledge. So they want to use, they want to use ECA platform to understand what's happening in Asia, what's happening in Africa, what's happening in the Middle East. So ECA was a great platform for them to learn. What are the association colleagues doing there? How do we uh, learn, do, learn through them? How do we share the best practices with them? So servicing them as a separate unit and, and focusing. Now we have a, a three-member staff working full-time servicing. We even have an advisory committee, which has 10-member association. So they look at every quarterly what's, the, what's important for the association. So those are the attractions that association felt that I need to be part of the community. So more than attending an event, I have huge other learning opportunities I can be part. And I'm glad to say that the association community has grown hugely. We almost had almost getting close to about uh, 200 associations now. So, uh, which which we, if not for the pandemic, we predicted this to grow close upon the 500 in the last two years. And it's a it's a association wide membership, or is it an individual membership in this case? Uh, it's it's association, but we we also start that you can represent more uh, from your association, so more than one. So the the association is a member. Uh, but you can have multiple people from your association so that we don't want to speak. So we have almost 400 association executives part of it now. So that keeps going on a daily basis because, uh, so it's not only the, the CEO of the association or the secretary general, it could be because, again, the thought is that we wanted them to actively engage and learn from their peers. So if I'm doing association, uh, say, legacy work, I want to learn from somebody who's doing legacy in another association. So that's what I do. That makes sense. And and um, so do you see yourself as competing with other kind of bodies that are bringing associations together? You know, there's a number of them, ASAE and the ESCA and those kind of bodies. Do you see yourselves as competition or are you are you able to partner with them in some way? Absolutely. No, we, we, we never see them as a competition. We, we partner. I mean, we have very strong relationship and partnership with ASAE, ESCA. AC Forum, we're jointly launching an event uh, going to happen uh, the speak of July in Lausanne. So it's always that ECA platform is very clear that it's engaging. Uh, again, all the, through all this partnership, it's again a benefit for ECA community members, uh, association member, association community representative to engage with those communities as well. So we consider ourselves is like a, a platform commonly developed so that it brings all the other entities together. And then the representatives who are part of ECA, association representatives, can engage with all these. And they can take part. We share all what's happening with these uh, association groups on a constant basis. So if they are not, not aware about what's happening, we share with them. So again, it's a learning platform for them. Oh, I mean, I keep getting the associations talking to me. Oh, there's an event of ESA. Can I take part? Yes, we say. Then we put through both parties together. They register there and they attend. So it, it's never a competition. I mean, we... Uh, because we, we, we also, Miguel, we never ever use a marketing uh, or terminology or marketing uh, to promote the association community. We always tell them, once you come on board here, you have all the other opportunities. So it's not building the numbers within ECA. That's not our objective. Our objective is to grow this community much uh, in a sustainable way so that they benefit and, of course, ECA members benefit as well. That's very interesting. I also wanted to touch on, you mentioned the the ICA Congress and other events that you've done in, in hybrid formats. 
Um, wonder if you could share any plans for the next Congress and what are you keeping from the hybrid? Are you going to do a completely hybrid event with multi hubs, et cetera, like you've done in the past, or are you going for a different model? You know, what, what are you, what are you holding on to and what are you kind of letting go from, from the pandemic? Yeah, again, a good question. I think the member feedback, what we got is they, they all wanted to become in person. Uh, so because members who met at the regional hubs uh, missed about other regional uh, sort of networking collaboration. So so we are looking at primarily having a, a full uh, in-person event, uh, but we're also looking at a segment of uh, uh, sharing the content through uh, live streaming or, 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 or what technology to use. We're still working on that so that the members who are unable to travel, unable to attend, they still have the opportunity. Regional hubs, yeah, we, we won't do that. So primarily, we want to try and get the entire community together as much as possible. Okay. And I, I, I assume you're not going to be calling it a hybrid then, but will it have a sort of online component, but be in person? Or how are you kind of marketing that? Something like that. We're looking at yeah, that model, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's that's the common model that a lot of people are, are heading towards. Setil, uh, anything else that you'd like to mention? I think we, we've covered a lot of different things. It's really interesting to see the evolution of ICA and especially you know, your, your role over the last three years. I think it's super interesting. And we've covered a lot of your kind of vision for the future of the industry. So if there's anything else you'd like to mention, let me know, or I can move on to the last question of the, um, of the podcast, which is, um, you know what the last question is, but anything else you want to mention? Kind request. I think, Miguel, we all work uh, across uh, the, the great industry. We all put our efforts together. We all worked very hard during pandemic and now where we are recovering, we are moving forward. I think all or everyone who's listening to this podcast, all my industry colleagues, I keep telling, let's get together and create awareness of our industry. Because if the bottom line, what we faced in the last two years is primarily who we are became questionable. You know? If we can achieve that, it's a long road, like I said earlier, but a little contribution by all of us at every grassroots level, if we can do that. Uh, so we, we, I've even started looking at projects uh, going into university students, entry level uh, people coming into our industry. The Future Leaders Council we set up is again another important project, again, mainly. Even if they leave the industry, they become our ambassadors, they talk about it. So we need to find ways, constantly create awareness so that again and again, our industry will achieve different milestones, we grow, and we attract uh, good uh, knowledge into our industry. But most importantly, it will become a sustainable industry and policymakers understand us better. So our advocacy efforts will be really justified if we are known who we are. Uh, I know through pandemic, to a great extent, we have surfaced a little bit as an industry because our venues are being used as vaccination centers, hospitals. So at least through that, we have been found out who we are. But yeah, if everybody can work together collaboratively, uh, that's a uh, great achievement. And that's one of the messages in the last three years as we have been reaching out to many, many of my colleagues across the world. Collaboration is so vital. I know we all spoke about uh, in the last two years. I only hope that we will continue. I can see that we all going again. Yes, we have all have to run our business. I don't say no there. We have to do, but not to forget that if we collaborate, the awareness can be created in a better way. Uh, rather than, you know, we go individual uh, on our own tracks, that will be, again, we'll fall back into what we know. I think that's an excellent message to end with. So I'd like to ask you to recommend someone um, that we should have as a guest on the podcast. And I'd like you to also say if you if you have any specific questions that you would like to ask them or that you suggest that we ask them when we do bring them on the podcast. Yeah. I think uh, my there are many people you can bring. If I would recommend, uh, again, bringing... Uh, somebody um, from a very leading startup company outside the industry, a, young, a younger person who, who's, who's, I mean, you know, all these startups are quite younger people who start, uh, ask them what what is the passion for them to start an industry and how would they look at it if they have to restart events industry? Excellent question. So really uh, looking for outside input, uh, fresh thinking, uh, maybe a, a different way of looking at the industry and seeing where where that leads us. And I think that, that would be a very interesting conversation. We can have a lot of learnings from there and then use it to our industry as well. Absolutely. I know it's tough one, Miguel, sorry. If we can find somebody there, you know. <laughs> yeah, no problem, we'll, we'll, we'll search. If you can help us find that person, I no, think that would be really I, I have a couple of people in mind, I'll, I'll yeah, redirect you away as well. 
Yeah. Perfect. That sounds great. Sentil, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for being with us today. And uh, I wish you all the best and look forward to hearing more about the ICA Congress and all the things you're doing with ICA in the near future. Thank you very much. We got sincere thanks for having me and I hope I shared whatever I can. Looking forward to seeing you in person in IMAX. Absolutely. Sounds good. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Event Manager Podcast. Please subscribe and rate the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. For the latest news and the best articles on technology and innovation in the event industry, head over to eventmb.com. 